All right. Good morning, C Mask viewers. I'm here with the dudes, Tim, Nick, Will. It's good to see you guys. I missed last Friday. It was my daughter's birthday. I think it was a good enough reason to miss, but uh, uh, it was a great episode and I'm happy to be here. So today uh, we're going to be talking about reflections on the frad interview that i did um that came out last wednesday i filmed it in in, in september and so, you know would love to hear your guys's thoughts and and points of what you think we got right maybe what we got wrong maybe what i maybe should have doubled down on a little bit more and after taking some time to 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 reflect on it obviously you know it goes without saying i'm really appreciative of of, of matt and josiah and their their hos hospitality it was it was it was a really cool experience and they were they were great guys it was a great conversation and it was um you know a bit it, uh, to be honest, I'm a pretty recent revert. You know, I reverted in, in in May 7th. I got confirmed, and it's kind of been like a tidal wave of these kinds of opportunities. And and he's got you know one of the biggest platforms online. So it was, it was a really really cool thing. I'm very I'm great very grateful for it. Um, and and the conversation I thought was was awesome as well. Um, so you know some initial reflections for me looking back on the conversation it wasn't a whole lot. I, I did I did pray, and I did multiple rosaries on the way on the flight, and you know on the way to the studio you know, for the Holy Spirit to, you know, kind of guide my words, tame my tongue, restrain my speech, point it in the right direction. And, uh, you know, despite the full day of travel, and it was quite exhausting because it was like you know, the whole day, me getting from Alberta to, to Steubenville, um, I'm like, man, how, how coherent and how sharp am I going to be? But I think reflecting back, I did, I did okay. The one point that comes to mind that's front of mind that we were discussing before we, we decided to hit record here, I wish I would have emphasized that probably the most integral piece of me reverting was the patriarchy in the church was the papacy. And I didn't mention that. And I wish that I did. Um, because, you know, we see, uh, we see the, the father in the chair, right? We see, we know Christ, the ultimate patriarch, he left a visible patriarchy. This is why we're on here on CMAS doing what we do, uh, having this conversation. And the other thing too, uh, was, it was clear to me after that conversation that I tried to uh, represent what patriarchy is not, what feminism is, what red pill is, but what patriarchy is not. And even in the over nuancing of it, there was still cope and still seethe. And it became abundantly clear that there's no way to have this conversation gently. And it kind of further affirmed what we're doing here with C-Mask. And yeah, we're heavy handed. But it's a heavy-handed and necessary response to how destructive and demonic uh, this this uh, influence of feminism has been on the culture and on the church and on marriages in general. Um, so those are my initial reflections. There's obviously you know more stuff I could say. It, it, it's been an incredible experience doing all the social media stuff. The fact that I'm even on here with you guys on C Mask used to be a you know a long time viewer here on the panel, been on Frad, doing the coaching thing, have this inner circle project. It's just a testament to, you know, God's grace. And I think you really, I don't know, for whatever reason, using me in this quote unquote space to, 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 you know, uh, make an impact. And I hope that I did that and specifically speaking to, uh, the red pill guys that maybe feel a little alienated. And my intention to go on there was not to go on and, and heavy handedly bash these guys like I've done before, because they get way more things correct than fem feminism ever could and will you said something really good before we hit record again was uh those red pill truths are illuminated in the church maybe cool to get into that but would love to hear your guys' thoughts and reflections on the episode as well we can start with you will so i just want to say first of all the i think it's an understatement mike to say that you were kind of clear and good energy i thought it was amazing all the way through after that yeah. flight and for the length of the interview as well that you spoke as you did like really impressive yeah. so it was. hats yeah. off to you Thank for you. that and the other thing was it was quite um like emotional to listen to as well because you spoke about some stuff that is very um dark and gritty in some ways and i've mentioned before that suicide is the top killer of men between an 18 and 45 i think it is more than heart disease more than cancer more than anything else suicide is and i was just thinking listening to you how great it is that you're here and actually doing this stuff because it could have gone that way right from what you were talking about with the void the despair the suicidal thoughts you might never have made it out so glory to god that you did and that you're doing the work that you're doing 
but being honest about that and actually going into that detail on a personal level, that's why I think guys resonate with you. Like you had the balls to say that stuff. Yeah. I, uh, I really appreciate that, man. I, um, I feel like in order to make the most of these opportunities that are given to me, that some still sometimes blow my mind, whether it's Seamask or Pints or whatever the, the businesses that, that I have is, is really revealing all of those innermost parts that probably some, most people don't want to talk about. And it's not to you know bring glory to me, but it's it's to point people to the truth of not just Christ, but Christ in His church. Like there were some topics in there that I almost considered like not talking about. You know, for example, you know, I got you know some some people were making fun of me for the erectile dysfunction bit, but I'm like, there's a hundred thousand guys that listen to that episode, and ninety nine thousand of them are like, oh, dude, that's me too. So it's like it's got to be some of it's got to be one of us has got to be talking about this. So I really I really appreciate it, Will. It was well, this, it's yeah, it's tremendous. What's so important, Mike, is that you're actually living out the humility without which masculinity is impossible anyway. And for anyone thinking they're having a little snigger about whatever Mike has said, like don't forget that at the general judgment, everyone's gonna know everything you've done anyway, bitch. Yeah. Right, we're all gonna find <laughs> out, like, because that's how you know. Well, I stuttered a little bit, but it's just I just I, I I giggle when someone says tit mouse. So when you say, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, the the point is that he's not afraid to actually just face reality and move forward from it. Like this is me. Yeah. You can't yeah. push someone over. You can't hit someone to the ground when they're already on the knees. It's like the Fulton Sheen yep. line about that. Yep. So Mike just does that in public, which is great. I love that about him. Um, yeah. Now, the point about the the papacy and having the father in the chair and that being the reason for the reversion, that was really important too. You know, we had the joke before about how orthodoxy is like multiple husbands and there's no real central authority there with the power to call the brothers to the table, etc. And it made me think as well, Mike, about why that's the answer to this um, covert trad feminist idea that I'll start leading when he's perfect. Like, just give me the perfect man, then I'll submit. Because you understood that it doesn't matter that mm -hmm. any given Pope is imperfect wow. in all kinds of ways yeah. as a man. You still submit to the authority, right? That's, that's exactly right. I mean, it is, isn't it not symbolic of marriage and household patriarchy? Where it's like, regardless of like who this guy is, um, I've got to submit to the bride of Christ, which is the church and whoever is occupying that seat. And my obligation is to pray and is to be obedient. He's not calling me to do anything that is um, spiritually dangerous to my salvation. I understand what it takes to be a, a you know, a, a proper Catholic and to do all the right things in order to, you know, the, the, the hope and the promise of the life to come. But that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and start calling him a, uh, a heretic and all of these other things. I'm actually quite careful of how I speak about not just Francis, but even some of the priests that I know that you could call quote unquote boomer priests, but who am I to say as the laity, who am I to say as a member of the, uh, of, of, of the church and to be disobedient. And is that not symbolic of the household patriarchy? If I were to be rebellious and start spewing off at the mouth and think that I know better, that's no different than the trad feminist wife that says, well, if he's, he's just got to love Christ, like Christ loved the church. And if he's, if he's becomes worthy enough, then I'll submit to him. It's, it's the same spirit of rebellion. They're just they're too emotionally. That, go ahead. Sorry. I would say, yeah, the, um, the household patriarch has a power that in constitutional terms, we would say is plenary. You know, he can tell his family anything to do. Whereas, your bishop has only a, a very, very partialized um, power over your your day to day life. It's really only an ecclesial power. So I, I would say that it's um, if your bishop tells you to wear, you know, a certain kind of dungarees or whatever, then you, you know you don't <laughs> have to listen. And uh, one thing I, you said, Mike. Um, also, you were so good. You were just crisp as an autumn apple. You were really good. It was really mm -hmm. impressive, and, and it was an understatement to, to partialize that. But I would say um, a second ago, you said submit to the bride of Christ. It's really that as part of the bride of Christ, the church, we all submit to the vicar of Christ who kind of stands in the place of Peter, who stands in the place of Christ. But yeah, it was it was an amazing, amazing performance. I've done that trek before, and I think I went on Frad show with three hours sleep, and you were so much crisper than me, much more, much more autumn apple-like. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, playfully accused you of performance enhancing drugs and you said it was nicotine and caffeine um, because the uh, my fiance and I and Tim and I were, were marveling at the recall of of full quotes and references to stuff like i i pride myself on that and you just that was it was really impressive um and yeah and the energy the energy too is very positive very measured um <clears throat> the the point about being nuanced i feel bad because you tried so hard to be just surgical and I'm reminded of uh, this this Eminem lyric. The chorus is, I am whatever you say I am. And if I wasn't, why would I say I am? In the paper, the news, every day I am. Ha, radio won't even play my jam. And every time Tim and I like talk about this stuff and and how we sort of have gotten to a point where the, our, the presentation of our views is just like pisses 99.9% .9 of people off. It's like, it's because we've gotten to that point where like we've tried to say, here's what I'm not saying. Here's what I am saying. Allow me to parse this through. And then they're like still screeching. So it's like, all right, screw you. I am whatever you say that I am. Right. And and at that point, then what, what what I've seen with with various pundits who have just gone full bore with that is it it, it ends up working in their favor ultimately. Um, yep. Because to Will's point, like they see your humility. Like you have this jacked, tatted up guy with absolute humility and like perfect clarity of mind. And they're like, wait a second, I need to check my assumptions here. Like he just said something that pissed me off, but he did it with like a peaceful smile and like kind words. How do I, how do I hate him? I really need to hate him here. There's, there's gotta be something that I can hate about this man. Um, and so I, I do think that's where like the humility is really important, but why I, I guess I've sort of given up on trying to like meet people where they're at um broadly on an individual level like i remember i was driving um my fiance and her friend around and i made like some very joking like offhanded comment like women shouldn't be allowed to read and it was a full joke obviously um but my fiance's friend was like wait a second what what are you saying and when i realized like in her voice that she was like about to believe that i believed that and was genuinely curious about like education and the woman's place or whatever. Then I like dropped the bit entirely and engaged with her with sincerity. Um, but up until that point, like I don't care anymore because everyone's just going to say to me, to me, I just joked about this. Like it would be so much easier if we were misogynists. Like if we actually hated women, things would be so much easier for us, but we don't. And like, yeah. that's, <laughs> <laughs> So, and that's anyway. and that's why and that's why women love us and we have so many female viewers for the channel it's when i yep. got sacked the women stood up harder for me than the men did yeah I, that's true okay it, it, it's a real thing when women actually see guys who are able to actually say the stuff that they wish other men were saying because they know it's good for them deep down yeah. that's yeah. important and the humor, I think, also like insulates you against if you if you're able to joke about it. It also shows that like you you're not afraid of the woman, and and that's I think so 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 important in in this kind of dialogue. If um, <clears throat> which I guess one one criticism that I have of Fred that I've heard him say on I I can't remember what shows, but I have definitely heard him say like we have to basically protect the ears of the the feminist catholic women who are hearing this like we need to be very gentle to like to reach out and like hand on the shoulder meet them i'm putting so many words in his mouth he never said any sentence like that but that sort of sentiment and um what's genuine like genuinely brings some heartache to me is when you have a guy such as yourself mike who does exactly that and and just has surgical precision with everything that he says and mm -hmm. it's all true and he still gets the right cross it's like okay i'm done i'm not doing that anymore <laughs> i yeah. tried you don't you don't deserve that there's something i don't <laughs> like about him he's really nice and he says all the right stuff it's just something i don't like about him but i can't put my finger on it and <laughs> it's it's the fact that they feel viscerally that you're not going to be bullied 
That's it, right. basically. Like, this is right. it, authentically. He's just speaking with integrity and he's not going to be manipulated out of fear. And that's the thing that at first, I think, puts their backs up a bit and then they realize what it means for them. And it's a man with clear boundaries they can actually respect. Um, uh, you mentioned Eminem, Nick. Uh, there's a great sea mask line in Eminem. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but go look it up. I don't rap to get the women. You guys know the one I'm talking about? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> See Mask Homework. Don't like don't look it up. Google Eminem. I don't rap to get the women. Probably the most anti feminist line in any rap song ever. Go look how it ends. Check the couplet out. It's great. Yeah. Um, right, homework. Go do that. And Nick's point as well about you can say all the right stuff and it still might not work. You can have the intellect of Aristotle or Plato. You can have the rhetorical flourish of St. John Chrysostom, whoever you want to pick, the greatest preachers, and you're still not going to convert people, mm -hmm. right? In, unless their hearts are opened by grace, you're not right. going to get anything done. So, Mike, you did a good job of, you know, modeling the right way to talk about this stuff. And it's okay that you had those pearls there and some people just wanted to stomp on them. It's not your fault. One, I just one did my, final. I did my homework during class here. I just I just got it. Well, <laughs> and I will I'm prepared to do a Shakespearean performance of the second line in the cup. <laughs> <laughs> um I uh just one one final um celebration of Mike too when we uh as you brought up the fact that he wasn't there last week because or Mike you brought up the fact we're in the there last week because of your daughter's birthday i remembered our episode on um the the wow. false kinds of patriarchy and like the billionaire patriarch basically and it's just such a perfect example of like no it's my daughter's birthday like mike your day starts really early i was just telling my fiance about this like somehow somehow you wake up without an alarm like before jocko willink is scratching his butt in the morning <laughs> i don't understand it and so like actually sea mask is pretty far into your day. So it makes sense that like, you're going to go celebrate your daughter's birthday. And, uh, I just know so many guys who'd be like, no, like when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. I do sea mask every Friday, no matter if it's my daughter's birthday or my wife's in the hospital. <laughs> it's like, no, you, your primary vocation is your family. And I just think it's, it's worth pointing that out to like the sea mask viewers that we don't just bluster about this. Like Mike's going to go be a dad. So. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's putting first things first and second things second. And I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a man of my word. I, I want to show up to as many C masks as possible, but the fact of the matter is, is like that, that ultimate. And I know I was waffling a little bit cause I, I wrestle with that bit of like ironclad discipline sometimes too, but I'm like, no, 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 wait, no, there's only so many, there's only one three year old birthday I get to celebrate with her. So I want to be fully I there. You. So I, mean, I, was I, like, I, I told you, I was like, dude, skip it and go, go <laughs> yeah remember what we we're talking about i was like no yeah go oh it. yeah totally man and and so to your point about casting pearls before swine it it, it reminds me of the the arguing with protestants you can't i don't do it anymore because you can't you know it, it's the holy spirit that converts it's not up to me no magical amount of apologetics or gentle hand holding of the feminist is going to bring them around and i looking back i'm like man i thought i was you know, it was pretty uh, uh, tactful and and soft about it, but it's it's clear it's clear that they all they want that would appease them is full blown capitulation, fold. That's it. Think think about it this way: like I'm I'm literally doing a slow road to have been for a long time slow road to a PhD. So in matters scholastic, I mean, I, I've shared some of my white papers and stuff um, occasionally online, like. I want to be really precise, but probably regularly week in, week out on this show, given the topic, I think I'm the least uh, like a smart bomb and the most like a dirty bomb on the topic. I'm just like, just blow it all up, man. And the reason is that this topic doesn't require precision. We yeah. have a, a mm -hmm. society on mass psychopathy where women think they're men and men think they're women and jokes and um, direct speech and more jokes and more jokes are the four things that, <laughs> that expose the tyrant that much. Jokes, direct speech, jokes, jokes. And is this this is it's not this is not academic. So it it is an absolute article of nature in terms of anthropology. This the 
first principle of human life, that there is a difference between the sexes. And it's not just that there's a difference. There's an ordinal taxonomy uh, erected, pun intended, between the sexes. And um, so I, I refuse to be over. If you look at when I I went on Fred's show uh, five years ago, and then you came on five years later, I think to the month, maybe five years and one month later, I announced the writing of the case for patriarchy and everyone, I mean, if you go look at the comments from that, cause I was, I was reviewing as I reviewed for the second time, your performance, I reviewed mine five years ago. And the comments are like, people didn't know that there would ever be such a man who's defending patriarchy again. That's done. You know, the boomers had told us all that's done. And I was like, it's really obvious. And it, one could argue, one could have argued that I think, I think both of us did a really good job and kind of, there is no other party. Red pill is not it. It is us. It's Christian masculinism. And we're the only guys really singing it properly, singing the tune properly. One could argue that perhaps I should have been more nuanced. Perhaps you could have used some more of the job. I mean, your, your, your performance, I think, was um, uh, really crisp, definitely crisper than mine. But I probably could have used a, a little bit more of that. But I sort of ideologically refused to because this is such a an obvious um uh, almost condescendingly obvious topic. What do you guys think of that? I think conversion is relational as evidenced by um, Mike and Will's dynamic. Um, and I think the reason why Will had any uh, impact on Mike's intellect and Will was a result of the fact that they had a pre-existing respect and admiration for each other um, on on things that they could harmonize on, such as lifting and discipline and virtue and truth and so on. And so um, what Will's tactics on Mike were were honed for him, and I think you guys have even talked about if, uh, if you guys were responding, or if you guys presented that to the world, that it probably wouldn't work on most of the world, but it worked with Mike because that was how you guys related to each other. Um, but yeah, it's not academic in that <clears throat> we can buttress it with academia and, and all the theology and all the, I mean, that's literally what Tim you've done. Like the last three Gordonian books was supporting everything academically, but then like interpersonally, I think guys just have to, gosh, nobody wants the nerd who like knows all the stuff, but his home is a mess. Like just be a cool guy. Make sure your home is actually in order. Make sure the women and the children in your life actually respect you. Um, and then and also the people clamoring for, for nuance are just folks that are looking for any fissure in the dam to, to break it apart. They're never the scholars because what a truly good scholar re re right. realizes is, is that unless you're dealing with a, a particularly um, fusty issue, which there aren't that many fusty issues, most things end up being binary. So good scholars who understand if you're you're that you don't want to make an argument overwrought, you want to be come out clear in your conclusions, specific in your premises, but clear in your conclusions. When you're singing it to the masses, they don't want to read all your top line math; they just want to see the bottom line. Right. So the nuance bros that, um, you know, are, are a big, big contingent in in Matt's audience, you know, because it's a very kind of cent center right audience, you know, a lot of good, a lot of good people there. But they're literally just looking to, to punch holes in your stomach like Tylenol. Uh, and so you, you don't once you realize this, all this goes to say we probably don't need to belabor it much longer. Once you realize how it be. Like, all right, I'm 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 just not going to do this anymore. And I'm always warning people about it. And and people just need to see it for themselves. Like, gosh, I was really nice. And you still have the um, the pearl clutchers clutching their pearls in comments. And it, it's once you see it for yourself, uh, your, your eyes don't lie. It's just like, I'm just going to I'm going to say it twice as direct next time. But that's hard to do because, um, Mike, even though you were nice, you were incredibly direct. Probably, yeah. Apple. You were, but the, the, the nuance bros are, um, it's, it's a very feminine characteristic of, and they're not really bros. I don't know why I said nuance. <laughs> the nuance. They's, uh, are, it's a very feminine characteristic to find, um, the, the very far 
left and far right little spicules of the bell curve and say, therefore, stop talking about the principle. Um, it, it's like, well, what if the husband uh, has one leg, drinks every night and like beats me? Um, it's like, OK, we're not talking about that. Stop pretending like that's what we're talking about. You mm -hmm. can't dodge like that. And so majoring in the minors on this subject is what everybody desperately wants us to do so that we capitulate, so that we drop the principles. And we're not going to drop the principles and we're not going to battle you on the ground of the of the minors Exception. here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exceptions. And they say nuance or seeing both sides, but what they're really looking for is for you to appease some way. They're looking for appeasement. And then that just invites further attack and it's seen as blood in the water and it's best just to hold your line and be clear about it. And you can actually see what the real line is because of what they don't talk about. Right. And the big thing that I want to bring up here that I don't hear anyone else talking about in the masculine feminine dynamics sphere, except what goes on on sea mask is this point. And the reason I don't think this point is talked about is everyone knows that feminism is, is contrary to nature. It's, it's socially acceptable now to say there's big problems with feminism for men and for women and how men and women are different. Everyone's willing to say men and women are different, but the thing they miss out is it's not just different. It's that although men and women are equal as human beings, Men as males are superior, like men are the superior sex compared to women as females. As human beings, we're equal, but comparing the two sexes, masculinity as a perfection is nobler than femininity as a perfection is. That's the real principle at stake here. That's the line that you have to just hold full-blooded. And if you don't, then you're not just doing yourself a disservice as a man, you're doing women a disservice as well. You're dishonoring them too. And of course, your kids, like boys or girls, growing up in an environment where that God-ordered hierarchy in the household and society isn't made clear. That's the real disorder that Tim has got his finger on when he talks about the gender dysphoria. It's, no, this isn't just about equality as human beings. Everyone agrees on that. We recognize there's some nuance to be had there, if you want to call it that, but that means there's still no appeasement. Men are just outright superior as men. If, if you're a Christian, you believe that. And if you're a, any kind of um, respecter of the natural law, you, you believe that. So New, Old Testament, New Testament, and natural law, the laws according to those three kinds of testaments, book of book of scripture, book of nature, sort of dichotomy comprising those three expressions of ontological truth as per anthropology. You just have to say what Will said. If you're a Christian or any kind of natural law respecter, that means Aristotle, Thomas, St. Paul, uh, Moses, men are ordinarily superior. And it's utterly clear. All of the patristics say it. Chrysostom says it. Jerome says it. Augustine says it. Ambrose says it. They all, and this is all in the case for patriarchy. Uh, the first Corinthians says it. Man was created first and therefore woman was created for man, not the other way around. She is our help meet. Your, your, it's not all women, but your wife is your help meet. You are not her help meet. There is an ordinal ranking there. There is an, a, a, a non-negotiable taxonomy there. So this is radically different in the ways Will's pointing up from saying, okay, well, now five, five and a half years ago, you know, um, case for patriarchy, I, I think got Catholics talking about this five years ago, people were saying, wait, what men and women are different. It was total third wave gender dysphoria, but now we've dug down into second and first wave gender dysphoria. And it's like, okay, well, they are very different, but still equal, equal in dignity just means that what, what it actually means in anthropological terms is that man who is created in the image and likeness of God, this is modeled on the will, the rational will and the intellect, image, rational will, uh, likeness, intellect. Animals don't have a rational will or an intellect. They are the, the two specific differences of human beings that are the divine spark in us or whatever you want to term it literarily. Women have them. 
uh, a rational will and an intellect, but um, to a lesser degree than men. And that's why men must lead. And, and you could say the will kind of corresponds with heart, which is associable with women and the intellect corresponds with head. But but really, to the extent that the will is rational, women have even a less rational will than men. But they have it because they're a qua human being insofar as they are human beings who share in our specific difference. So it's just, it, again, if you guys want to go really specific, if there's someone challenging this or offended by this, equal in dignity does not mean equal in rank. Uh, we can get really specific. There isn't a single Christian father who started to believe this until feminist Pope John Paul II, who who really started down a lot of these Fran- Pope Franciscan paths of mm-hmm. you know feminism, ecumenism, mm-hmm. kissing the Quran, uh, doing away with the death penalty. Really, we don't say it often enough. The forerunner to um, Francis was John Paul II. These things had never been said about Christian feminism before him. Oh, and by the way, someone was um, boondoggling me on Twitter about mutual submission. The word mutual never appears in Ephesians 5, verse 21. It just doesn't. So it's it's like Martin Luther adding only, faith only. Yeah, he says faith. He doesn't say only. There's no word mutual in verse 21. Sorry, ladies. I was going to bring up mutual submission because I think that this um, very clever bit of egalitarianism that like, okay, 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 fine. Men and women are different, right? Like men can like bench press and like women can like change diapers or whatever. We're, we're better at different things. Um, we, I think we, not us, but we kind of as a whole were swindled that like, oh, okay, cool. They finally got it and they didn't. And I think that's why mutual submission has the breath of life that it has is because- yep. They're like, well, it has to be mutual because we're equal in rank. We're just like perfect in different ways. Like I'm most perfect woman, which equals 10, and you're most perfect man, which equals 10. And so 10 and 10 can't like 10 can't be lower than 10 and 10 can't be higher than 10. So we must be mutually submissive to like the common mission. Um, <clears throat> and it's like, no, it's 10 and five or whatever number you want to pick. And it's all you will always be lower. Otherwise, Saint Paul, the natural law, the divine law, would be asking something unjust. We that would be tyranny. That would be an unjust um, exploit of power over somebody else, and they should feel resentment and bitter bitterness. In fact, mutual submission should make women bitter because they have no reason to submit to their husband if they're equal to them. They should be pissed all the time. Why? Why should I? I'm I am as good. In fact, and this is in the trailer that I'm cutting for what a woman is. I I, I searched. Um, do I have to submit to my husband? And there's this Reddit post on the front page of Google. Do I have to submit to my husband when I have um, better decision making skills and like forethought than he does? And why? And it's like okay, maybe maybe you pulled a Lauren Southern and just married like the worst possible option for you. You used zero discernment and picked somebody who was bad for you. Um, probably not, but let's say that you did. That's what they should be feeling all the time. And I think that's what a lot of women do feel. It's like, well, actually I am smarter than my husband. Like he didn't even get like a bachelor's degree and I got a bad, like he's an electrician and I got, I have a master's and, or like whatever they want to say, like I keep a calendar. I use highlighters in my calendar. Like I'm smarter than my husband. Why do I have to, that's what all, and I wonder actually if that's sort of where some of the ire is like under the surface for these women is that like ah, mutual submission. Okay. Yeah, no, this is good. This is good. Right. 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 Ladies, this is good. We both submit to each other. And I think in the back of their, of their limbic system, it's like scratching at the brain. Like, no, this is still wrong. This is still wrong. Cause if we're the same, why do I have to do what he's telling me to do? <laughs> right. And what, and what's the root of that? If, the church teaches that pride is at the root of all sin, ultimately. When you drill down far enough, it's pride. What's pride? So it's an, an inordinate uh, estimation of one's own excellence. Like They don't feel they should be subject. They rate yeah. themselves too highly because of this false vision of what women are. 
So they don't recognize that being put in their proper place by natural law actually honors them. They think they need to be higher because that's what they deserve. And this is why you look at a great pagan intellect like Aristotle and he looks at the world and just comes to the conclusion like, hmm, wow, look at all this stuff. Um, men are closer to Logos than women are. Right? That's the correct insight. You don't know what to do with it yet until you have it fleshed out properly by the Catholic intellectual tradition. But you can see that just from looking around. And the entire feminist narrative about human history even contains that, if you think about it hard enough. So how is it that men managed to pull off this massive worldwide <laughs> oppression of women for the entirety of human history? Like, were they smarter? Were they stronger? Did they trick the women or did they just overpower them? Because that's pretty impressive that they managed to do this, like against the women's will, they just yeah. took power. And that tells you everything you need to know. And then once you actually look into what Catholicism teaches and zero of what I'm about to say here is some kind of quirky original take that I've just come up with. It's stuff that I couldn't formulate properly until someone way smarter than me, St. Thomas Aquinas, just expressed it so simply like this, but it's like crystalline in the clarity. So mm. this is paraphrasing, but women can't be rulers of any type. They can't be rulers. Why? They're inferior in reason. That means they're not fit for directing or commanding. Now, because they need direction, it makes them natural subjects. So men are superior and the natural rulers of any society, whether it's domestic, civil, or ecclesiastical. So that means the ruler of any society, including the family, must be a man. Women are by nature unfit to rule, and men are by nature fitted for it. So for sure, equal as humans, but not as males and females. As males, men are superior to women as females. This is because the masculine sex is more perfect than the feminine sex. And because yeah, I mean of the superiority of the male sex, it was this sex that Christ assumed instead of the inferior female sex when he incarnated. Sorry, Tim. Sorry, I was just going to say how many times have you guys heard me say men are natural leaders, women are natural followers, uh, with men uh, run the proper accidents of activity and expressivity, and with women run the um, proper accidents of passivity and receptivity, even in the thing right. about the marriage act. Um and people always go, oh, like all men can be president. No, no, no. Not all men are wired to be naturally leaders of other men. That requires an extraordinary man, extra leadership properties. But all men are hardwired to be leaders of many single cells of society called the family. And that requires less leadership and more just you're sort of normie beta male even though there are all these guys out in the burbs are henpecked to death by their wives. This is a an, 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 an very perverse disorder because they do have enough of what it takes. Like Nick's always talking about morally speaking, even people from bad backgrounds have just enough grace to make the correct moral decision. That's how God created even nature post fall, or that's how God adapted nature even to be post fall. Even these cucky guys have enough leadership properties to lead not other men, but a family. Leaders of men are rare, but and women, conversely, even extraordinary ones that have more of the quidditative essence correlative to leadership don't have enough to lead any man. So there are exceptions to the rule, but the exceptions to the rule are, are never enough to overthrow the rule in this case. Sometimes exceptions to rules actually temporarily overthrow it. In this case, it's beautiful. Even like Nick said, a, a master's degree holding woman with like an electrician husband, like she still doesn't have the prudence, the phronesis, requ the practical judgment requisite to run the household. The guy does. Well, and keep the lights on. What? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep the lights on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And fix them if they go out. But I was going to say that this is the, the corollary to, to Will's point, um, which is a kind of very, very constructive critique of this excellent show that Matt and Mike did together. Matt and Mike uh, did a good job. They coupled well. No homo. Um, I would just say that. So it, it seemed like I, I also give props to Matt that he was saying that uh, um, women shouldn't vote. 
you know, it should be one vote per family. And that, of course, should be the man is the household. I was I was happy to see um, him say this is a basic point of anti-feminism, but I was happy to hear for Matt's sake to hear him say it's so a good. Good job, Matt. Uh, you know, that's that's a change over the last five years since I was on uh, Pints. But I would say that that Matt did seem to be um, hazy on the distinction Will makes because and therefore he was hazy on this distinction um, between the relationality of true Christian masculinism, uh, where it stands as a kind of mean between the red pill on one end and feminism on the other. He was treating it as if either he assumed that it's an arithmetic mean. Christianity, Christian patriarchy is the exact midpoint between the red pill and feminism or actually an inverted geometric mean. What what it really is, is a, a geometric mean, like Aristotle says, all virtues are geometric means between uh, vices of excess and vices of deficiency. Courage is a, a, a geometric mean, the golden mean between cowardice and rashness. But because it's a geometric mean rather than an arithmetic mean, it's closer. It's not a midpoint. It's closer to rashness. He says all of the virtues, all being situated between a vice of deficiency and a vice of excess, are always close to one or the other. And he usually tells you which vice it's closer to. Well, the geometric mean of Christian patriarchy masculinism is easily closer to the red pill, still a vice in the ways that Mike articulated well far closer than feminism and feminism is the further, the bigger miss uh, from the mark. And um, that just wasn't aside from Mike articulating it a few times at the end, that wasn't articulated on the show. Uh, One suspects because um, either, either, either just honestly and innocently Matt hasn't yet come to that conclusion or he, you know, some combination of he hasn't come to the conclusion and he doesn't really want to be the expressor of it because there's a lot of, um, females in the audience that would get mad, but that, that is the case. That is the fact. And it's the corollary of Will's distinction. So just to dumb that down a little bit, if, would that be, uh, like saying courage and rashness, um, if they exist on a continuum that the, well, courage is the rashness and cowardice, rashness Rashness and cowardice. cowardice. Thank you. Rashness and cowardice, that courage is a lot closer to rashness than it is to cowardice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, it's Very not like, it, it's not directly in the middle. It's way closer to this. And so if um, this kind of goes back to our commentary on the presentation of these truths, like we don't need to account for the 5%, which in this subject, it's much closer, like 0.1% exceptions, but we'll just say 5% on the sort of geometric basis. Um, to protect against getting this wrong because it's so, so, so much closer to just, yeah. to just say, Hey, this is how the world is. And like act in that direction as much as you can. Like, trust me. It's like when uh, uh, we were talking about this on uh long leaf trace, um, like women who think when they start lifting that they're going to like, look like Arnold, like, don't yeah. worry about it. It's <laughs> yeah. Like it doesn't even happen to the guys with androgen receptors and like testosterone producing gonads. Don't worry about it. You're not going to fall into vice if you're chasing down like Christian patriarchy. It's not going to happen. Yeah, this is like if a girl comes out there because you're a basketball player, you're like, oh, you want to play knockout? You know, this little two two ball game from the free throw line. She's like. Well, I'll play with you. This is the first time I've ever played, but I don't want to become Michael Jordan. I don't have time for a career on the <laughs> Well, you, you, you don't you, worry you, about it. You can even see it in what Mike said at the start of the show today about how when he was on his way to go and speak with Fred for hours on scripted, he was praying that his speech would be guided by being reined in, right? And what does yeah. that tell you about the way in which Mike is inclined? naturally like which vice he inclines to is taking right. scalps right yeah. he was going to go in and then go too hard rather than not hard enough and that tells you something about a man it's like you know a lot about someone whether he, he tends to work too hard or not hard <laughs> enough and you know which one's more masculine so it's all about right. striking that balance 
as Tim's saying, but it's not a 50-50 balance. It's not like you're on a fulcrum trying to balance the seesaw in that sense. The halfway is exactly where it is. And it's a great thing to bear in mind because it explains why someone like Tate has the appeal to men that he does because he gets more right by natural law than the Christian simp. It's a really deep insight. And we're not saying, as Aristotle did, smart as he was, he still made plenty of mistakes. We're not saying that this means that women are just defective men, right? It, it's not that um, femininity is imperfect masculinity. They are both perfections. It's just that even at 100% of each perfect, masculinity is still more noble. And when we're thinking about the Adam and Eve story, I mean, I didn't have any clue that this is what it meant when I was a teenager rejecting Christianity because I thought that it wasn't masculine. It's crazy. It's the opposite. So the woman was made after the man, from the man, and for the man. Now, that is the most crimson of red pills. And <laughs> Elliot Hulse talked about this when we had him on C-Mask. The Bible was the thing that red pilled him most of all. So when Mike's saying that he saw truth in the red pill, but didn't really have it fully illuminated until that came, that light came from the Catholic intellectual tradition, that's what it means. Femininity exists for the sake of masculinity. And that's what it means to actually return to an understanding of patriarchy, which is just reality, like in all its dimensions, natural, supernatural as well. Tim's books are the best at fleshing out what this means and started the debate, and it still hasn't caught up publicly with what he started. Is there an analogy that you guys can offer for what you just said, Will? Like, I'm trying hard to think of like, like a general and a private, uh, a wolf and a dog, like Captain a dog and is first a mate, dog. Captain and first mate, like. Yeah, is it like that sort of thing? Um, I'm just trying to find an analogy to like, yes, they are both perfect in and of themselves, but one is superior to the other. Like, what does that look like in any other domain? I think that could help me and other people. The anthropological problem here is that um, there's some 20th century pseudo philosophers like Edith Stein that attempted to, on the basis of... of um, the perfections argument make a um, a um, substantial form of female and a substantial form of male, and there's not the only substantial form of a human being. Um, you know, um, for um, form is the first act of of matter, right? Or um, matter form is the first act of matter. Matter is the first act of form. Is this specific difference, and it's 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 sex non-specific. Um, the idea of a human being, our specific difference, the way we are in our genus is animal. Our specific differences were the rational animal. That's why Aristotle and even Thomas inclined toward talking about women as just imperfect men, because unlike Edith Stein's you know pseudo philosophical girl philosophy. Um, uh, we don't have a quantitative essence that's distinct between maleness and femaleness. Uh, Aquinas says this in um, the De Ante mm -hmm. in a sense. So you can't go there where you say, it even seems sort of well-ordered to say, oh, isn't there a quantitative essence a pertinent to maleness and one a pertinent to femaleness? No, because it's a genus species thing. We're not a different species. Um, right. we, would, okay. yeah, we would be a different substantial composite if there were a different one. So does that leave you saying that the male, that the female is an imperfect male? It sort of tempts it, but I do agree with Will that there is a perfection to femaleness. It's almost just um, left, given that Edith Stein was wrong, left as a kind of mystery of nature. You know, they're perf perfect in their own right. They're And they do have rational will and, and intellect. It's just less operative in nature, but they are as... Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the early patristics said God's most uh, beautiful creation, women. So we can give them that. Like there, that's that's why women are created to be beautiful. They're much more beautiful than men. They're the fairer sex. So they're more perfect in terms of looks. This is not just a, a heterosexual thing where we're guys, and since we're not into dudes, we think 
that women are better looking, but they think we're better. That's why women aren't sexually that obsessed with a man's looks. Women were created in terms of human beings. They are the fairest appearance. And that, that, that seems to be something of a fair trade-off because um, people tend to care about their looks a lot, especially today. I think uh, more, and I totally agree with that. I think, ought, you know, maybe I've said this before, maybe I haven't uh, more Christian men in general ought to take more red pill principles and apply it to their lives because they, they're already operating from the yep. correct worldviews, the Christological worldviews. They can po- kind of separate the, 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 the good from the degenerate. I'll, I'll, I'll say that I'm not going to call myself some Christian red pill guy, but I'll because <laughs> th- those red pill inherent biological truths are already inherent to our faith. So it's like, well, what came first? Well, God, the church and, and, and scripture and the order of creation that's clearly written on Genesis. That's why feminism kind of confuses me because it's a clear inversion. If you look at the order of Genesis, who was the first fruits of creation? How was woman created? Out of man for man. Okay. So it just makes sense. There is a superiority and there is an, an order. There's I, I so tired. And I've seen this all over the comments. Yeah. The man's the head, but the woman's the neck. It's like, so the but what turns the head? That's the dumbest right, thing. Right. That that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And they they'll cope and see all day. I'll say this too. Andrew Tate gets ninety percent more right than uh, even the most mild feminist because at yeah. least he's not gender dysphoric. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, the while talking about overlap, I think it's important to really highlight what one of the deepest disagreements between Christianity and the red pill is. And as I was listening, Mike, the only thing that I wanted to correct you on was this. And I think it's really hard to leave this element of red pill thinking behind. You made the point that a guy who doesn't get married, um, what's he going to be? A genetic dead end. Now, that's super interesting because every Catholic priest is a genetic dead end. Okay, so it's the hardest element of the red pill to completely leave behind while absorbing all its truth, which is that um, celibacy is actually a higher calling than marriage. Like it's difficult to wrap your head around because it means rejecting their entire naturalistic paradigm. But when you actually introduce the supernatural into that and you're not just a monkey in trousers trying to spread as much seed as possible, that's what you end up with. Like. The genetic dead end can actually be the highest form of a masculine life because what is his real, um, you know, legacy is his progeny and spiritual, like the priest is a spiritual father and that legacy he can leave in that way is um, even greater in some ways. So that's the only thing that I think um, isn't made clear enough. Yeah, there's plenty of agreement, but really what it comes down to is materialism versus a proper spiritual outlook on the world i think you actually just real quick and i completely agree with you and i appreciate you bringing that up when i specifically said that i was talking more to the guys that complained about marriage and not getting married and opting out and not being called to uh, otherwise like it's in scripture i completely agree with you but yeah there was a few comments like that you mean like like priests and like nuns it's like i'm not talking about them at all maybe it wasn't clear enough but in that specific context, let's talk about those those doomer guys. But you are absolutely correct, Will. I appreciate you uh, bringing that up for sure. I, th- I th- find that point that Will made. I, I've never considered it in um, with respect to women, but uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary got to fulfill her feminine telos as a mother and remain a virgin perpetually. And I think that's kind of a miracle in and of itself. Well, it is a miracle, obviously. Um, but it's <laughs> na- narratively, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very similar to something impossible and magical. Um, <laughs> but it's also narratively beautiful that she got to maintain that virginity, that continence in the way that with a Catholic priest, it is the higher calling and still be a mother at the same time, which is the fulfillment of femininity itself. Um, on the point of, <clears throat> uh, I think I think I understand how the red pill guys go wrong, and I think it's the same way that the boomers go wrong in that they, both the boomers and the red pill guys recognize the truth of the office. Okay, I as a man am superior to woman by by nature, by office, by rank, and then they go. Therefore, give me give. Pay, 
pay homage. Come, come now. I am, I am boomer parent. Like, well, I'm your parent, right? Like, so therefore you owe me X, Y, and Z. It's like, yeah, on paper, totally correct. This is, this is the office. But you can't just call in the man card or the patriarch card and have done nothing to earn it, um, which I think is what the uh, kind of ironically, as I'm, I'm totally making this up as I go along here, but the the Catholic feminists, the female Catholic feminists, um, I think would sympathize with this sort Sym of expectation. Sympathize. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sympathize <laughs> with this expectation of honoring an office. Um, you definitely hear this with women a lot, where it's like they they want to like worship the mother, the the space of the mother, like um, and kind of deify it, turn it into this Gaia thing, like oh we're the life giver, and um, I think that's an attempt to raise it to the equal status, to the equal rank of the man. Um, hmm. but, but with a boomer, like you can't just say, well, because I am parent, because I am older, you therefore should behave a certain way toward me. Like there's a, there's a basis for that fourth commandment. You take care of them when they're ill, you treat them with, with charity. You might even treat them with more charity than you would with like some other person of the same generation. Like, okay, I'm going to go just one step further and, and extend that extra bit of charity because like they're my parents. Um, but they can't uh, cash in their office without merit any more than anybody else can. And I think that's what the red pill guys are doing where they're like, I am man, therefore serve, submit, be nice, be feminine, be sexual. Without, without even being married. Without <laughs> even be being married. Um, and so the, the only point that I was trying to make there is I just realized that there that's like a similar um, entitlement that like the boomer generation has. It's like you want the trimmings of traditionalism with zero of the responsibility whatsoever. It's like that's not how this works. Right. The um, I, I've got a lesson coming up in a second, but because the awareness of patriarchy and masculinity is growing, what people are going to find is that the pressure to cave on what the real lines to hold are is actually going to get stronger and stronger. And you even see this yeah. in myth and legend in the, the Gilgamesh epic. And this is what I've done for most of my life is teach literature in the epic of Gilgamesh. He has to fight and kill this like water goddess Ishtar and he realizes it's like a struggle between the masculine and the feminine that she respects his strength and virility so much that she recognizes that maybe she can seduce him um, before he gets too strong. And he has to, to kill her to be able to move forward and actually affirm himself as a man. And there's a, a, a truth in that. And the um, psychiatrist, the student of Jung, Newman, um, wrote about that poem, commenting on Gilgamesh's battle with her. Uh, the stronger the masculine ego consciousness becomes, the more it is aware of the emasculating, bewitching, deadly, and stupefying nature of the great goddess. And that's the battle that guys are going to face in the years coming forward as patriarchy is actually fleshed out properly based on its true principles. There'll be all kinds of bewitching temptations for you to go and live the um, superficially trad life and as long as you get your raw milk and whatever else it is and your sourdough <laughs> bread um then you're happy right i feel so called out <laughs> that, that, that's just a a um another siren song that ultimately is there to emasculate you if you're going to cave on what truly matters so look mike went on there and after all said and done he quoted father ripica saying that feminism is hell on earth like the beginnings of it and that's the key point and so few people are saying that. So congrats to Mike for getting out there. And congrats to Matt for letting him say it. I, I salute him, you know, coming coming around ever slowly on this. So I, I'd love to see him come full circle, come all the way. Good show, guys. God bless, God bless you guys. Take care, everybody. Good job, Mike. Appreciate you guys, bro. See ya.